Hello, this is Matthew Robert Payne and this is just an interview we're going to have with Philip that's mentioned in the Bible. Um, I hope you can uh, handle the noise that might you might be hearing from outside. They're doing some um, renovating or something in the house next door. Um, so uh, I welcome Philip here. Um, it's good to see you here. Uh, once again, uh, I've got some uh, hard questions, certainly questions I couldn't answer uh, in my own mind. Uh, there's certainly questions that uh, I couldn't make up the answers for, and so I need uh, a special assistance uh, from my interviewee. Uh, only he seems to know the answers to the questions, and uh, so we'll, we'll start with question one. Question 1 says, Philip, most of the disciples were introduced to Jesus, but Jesus came to you and asked you to follow him in John 1.43. Can you tell us why and a little bit about this experience? Uh, Jesus uh, knew uh, who his disciples were. He'd, uh, Jesus had seen visions of his disciples. Uh, the, the Father had shown him visions of his disciples, and he just uh, he knew the locations to go uh, to get each of his disciples. And I was just one. He was led to the area where uh, I was found, and uh, he approached me and asked me, "Could I be one of his disciples and follow him?" Um, it, it's an extraordinary thing. As a Jewish boy, um, you, you get the opportunity to study um, the Jewish law and you get the opportunity to study under a rabbi and uh, the rabbi at the end of uh, the study time uh, picks the best students and they become rabbis. And uh, at that time, the, the rabbi says, follow me and uh, and the best students uh, become students of the rabbi and become rabbis themselves. So it's a particularly exciting thing for a Jewish boy uh, to be asked uh, the words, follow me. So that's something Matthew knew and it's something that's true in history. And so um, you can't imagine the excitement as a, as a man uh, who's been passed over as as a rabbi's uh, student uh, for for Jesus to approach me and say uh, follow me uh, was uh, especially exciting for me. Uh, I um, I was just a ordinary chap. Uh, I wasn't uh, particularly uh, really fond of the way that the Jewish faith was propagated. I, I wasn't particularly fond of uh, all the rules and the regulations, uh, though I did my best to obey the law. I wouldn't say that um, I was like Paul, uh, passionate for the for uh, the Jewish faith, uh, uh, that Paul was zealous after the things of the Jewish faith. And once again, Paul gets a mention in one of these interviews. Uh, Matthew has to laugh at that. Um, so um, I wasn't an uh, extraordinary student of the Jewish uh, system. Uh, I wasn't uh, a passionate uh, follower of the Jewish uh, thing, but I, I was a little bit of a skeptic. And uh, and uh, I suppose that can be a good thing sometimes when uh, something is out of line, a skeptic will normally come forth and uh, announce that it is. But when Jesus approached me, he had such a, um, to, use, uh, to use a modern term, um, uh, a spiritual term, he had such an aura. Some people would understand what that is. He had such a presence. Uh, when Jesus uh, entered a room, uh, everyone in the room knew who he was. Everyone in the room knew that something holy and something um, amazing had entered the room. Uh, he had this amazing uh, presence that just went out from him. Um, Mary Magdalene explained it as a way of, um, you can imagine uh, being in a room and someone looking at you and you can feel uh, the presence of someone's eyes focused on you and most often you'll turn and uh, see a person looking at you and they'll quickly turn away. 
Well, it's that feeling uh, that was manifested in everyone. Uh, everyone felt like they were being looked at uh, when Jesus entered a room. He, he simply entered a room and, uh, and his presence fell over the whole room and uh, people would look up and uh, wonder who it was. Um, some of them spiritually aware would know who it was. Uh, some others would question and uh, wonder who it was. Uh, well, Jesus was like that. One time Jesus appeared uh, to Matthew in the flesh and the same thing happened. Um, he was sitting uh, in a seat in, in a line in a homeless hostel and he's sitting lining up for a meal and a presence entered the room behind him and he turned to see who was causing uh, the disturbance in the presence in the room and he turned to see a man and he, he whispered to his friend, that's Jesus, and uh, his friend nodded and... Um, and so you could tell it was Jesus. So like I said, the spiritually aware could uh, tell who was aware. Certainly um, uh, the spiritually aware could tell who it was. Um, when he approached me and said, follow me, uh, he was dressed like a rabbi. And uh, I certainly knew that this was unorthodox, but a rabbi can choose his followers uh, and uh, he was choosing me and uh, as I have just explained he had this strong presence about him that said this is authentic this is something from God and so I went with him it's um I I can't put into words the English language uh, it is it stops me but uh, I can't put into words uh, the feeling of exhilaration uh, to be asked by Jesus to follow him. Uh, it was an exciting, uh, uh, wonderful uh, thing to be asked and uh, certainly uh, presented um, your mind with hundreds of questions like what's going to happen now and what are we going to do and um, what am I going to learn and how, how is this all going to work out. And uh, Jesus would just walk along and pick his disciples and um, we we grew into a merry band of followers who uh, listened to every word. Uh, Jesus was an amazing person. Uh, he uh, Matthew's heard him preach for two hours uh, through Matthew's um, mouth, and he heard Jesus preaching, and uh, and he, he's intoxicating. Uh, he's very addictive uh, to listen to. He just speaks and it's just pure honey coming out of his mouth and uh, so he was uh, an amazing person to uh, follow and listen to uh, you could listen to him all day long and then all night long uh, followed uh, behind that and sometimes Jesus would speak all day and um, he was uh, certainly exciting to listen to and it was certainly a privilege uh, to be picked by him uh, he, as, as I said, uh, some, as your question said, some uh, disciples were shown to him by others um, and I was specially picked, but we're all picked by the Father. That's the thing that was in common. Uh, Jesus didn't pick any renegades. Even the picking of Judas was on purpose because he needed someone to betray him. So um, Jesus, uh, I'll have you know that Jesus, even with his foreknowledge that Judas was going to betray him, he never treated Judas any differently. I know some of you would think that he may have treated Judas dip differently and kept him uh, at arm's length, but he, he trusted Judas so much and loved him so much that he gave him the money purse, even though the Bible says that Judas was stealing out of it. Jesus has tremendous grace. Um, Judas was given every opportunity uh, to, to be a follower and given every grace uh, to uh, get on top of his sins and get on top of his frailties. Um, Jesus gave him every grace and uh, if it were possible that he, he didn't um, betray Jesus, that might have happened. But Jesus gave him all the grace that, uh, that possibly could have been given to a person. Some people, it's just their destiny to do bad things. And uh, I want you to be aware that... Uh, um, it's my testimony that uh, Jesus was very loving uh, to Judas and uh, treated him um, just like one of us, one of the special 12. And um, so I, I just uh, 
Holy Spirit uh, wanted you to uh, be aware of that. Question to you, Philip, uh, your name means lover of horses. Can you tell us uh, if you are and why you think you were given that name? My, my father's brother's a name was Philip and uh, my, my mother chose, and my mother and my father chose that name because they dearly loved uh, my uncle. Um, uh, so that's something that's not in scripture, but that's uh, something that existed. Um, uh, I, I, horses in uh, Jesus' day were um, uh, things that, uh, the items um, that rich people had. Uh, you, you notice that even Jesus, uh, when he came into Jerusalem, rode on a donkey, he didn't ride on a horse. Um, and so... Um, I my name meant a lover of horses, but it wasn't picked um, because I would ever be around horses and be a lover of horses. Uh, it was picked because it was my uncle's name, and uh, and my brother dearly, my father dearly loved his brother and wanted to bless his brother with uh, naming him, uh, naming me after his brother. So um, that's a really loving thing a brother would do. Um, of course in heaven um, I've spent a lot of time with horses and uh, and uh, we uh, go to war in horses, uh, on horses and uh, we're going to go in the final battle in, in the world on horses. You have to wonder um, are you going to uh, in, in the future if you ride a horse in the last great battle are you going to be in the spirit uh, riding a horse, uh, are you going to be spiritually uh, translated and uh, riding a horse in the spirit or is that going to be uh, a flesh and blood horse and you're going to be in flesh and blood and riding a horse? Uh, you have to wonder about that. So many people um, think that they're going to be riding horses in the last day's army but uh, do they really think about it? Are, are they really going to be physically on a physical blood and flesh horse and are they going to be in physical blood and why would um, why would Jesus need uh, an army on horseback uh, to fight a physical war when one word out of his mouth could crush the enemy so um, I just let you wonder that that's um, another thing the Holy Spirit wanted to bring up and have you consider um, or, or are you already part of the army and is is the uh, um, horses already marching and, and we already are uh, part of this spiritual army that's going forth to conquer the world for the sake of Christianity. Um, so um, I'll let you ponder that one. Are you going to ride a physical horse uh, in the last day's battle or is that a spiritual war that we're going to fight spiritually? Um, are you actually on your horse now riding in formation in the army for Jesus or are you waiting for a day where you'll be invited to um, be part of that army? Question three, Philip, you were confused by many with Philip the evangelist and deacon. The deacon had four prophetic daughters and you had three. Two of your daughters said to be buried by you live virgins until old age and the third was said to be led by the Holy Spirit and buried in Ephesus. Can you tell us about your family? Um, I had, uh, like, like you said, uh, like that question said and researchers have, have said, um, I had daughters that uh, lived as virgins. Uh, uh, it was a respectable thing uh, in the Jewish faith and in the Christian faith to live a life devoted to God. I'd... I'd, um, I'd I take exception, well, um, you probably didn't mean it this way, but um, for people to understand, um, my whole three daughters were led by the Holy Ghost, uh, by the Holy Spirit. Uh, it said in the question, uh, one of your daughters was led by the Spirit and is buried in Ephesus. Um, uh, Matthew imagines you mean um, that she was led by the Holy Spirit to Ephesus, um, where she was buried um, and now he can understand the question. Uh, yes, yeah, so um, 
so they were all led by the Holy Spirit and uh, my, my daughters were precious to me. Um, when uh, you um, become a Christian uh, and you're totally uh, overcome by Jesus, um, even family uh, become less important to you. Uh, uh, the, the things of the world that the world considers uh, precious uh, become less important and uh, my my daughters um, my daughters fully embraced Jesus and fully embraced uh, his message and uh, become passionate people themselves and I was very proud of the way they stood uh, and uh, carried out their life um, they uh, made me proud they did many great works um, they um, they not only uh, preached and uh, and spoke and uh, had an influence on people, but they led people to the Lord with their testimony and their stories, and uh, and they did uh, marvelous works. Um, it, the best thing uh, that a, a father can have isn't so much for his daughters to marry, but um, the best thing uh, that can happen to a father is uh, for uh, his daughters or, or for his sons to be totally and passionately in love with Jesus and uh, totally focused and given over. And Paul mentions, um, once again, Paul's been mentioned, Paul mentions that it's best to live um, as a virgin, uh, solely devoted to, to Jesus and solely devoted to God. And it's better uh, if you live as a virgin and, and uh, have a life like that because you can be solely devoted to God and not your husband. And uh, my daughters um, uh, lived that sort of life uh, because uh, that was the best life. Uh, of course, they had to have um, support uh, from the church and support for income. Um, and uh, they they uh, did various things uh, to earn money for themselves. Uh, but uh, they uh, lived an exemplary life and uh, made me very proud. It's uh, a very... Um, exciting thing to be a father and have your children uh, outperforming you and uh, and uh, making an example in the community that not only uh, have you got a good name in the community for the things you do and uh, the the outreaches you do and and the blessings that you bring to the people but it's even a double blessing to have children that are bringing honor to your name and uh, they um they focused on not so much bringing honour to my name, they focused on bringing honour to the Lord Jesus' name. Um, they lifted his name up. Um, they were a demonstration of the Holy Spirit on earth and uh, they were powerful uh, girls and uh, very gifted prophetically and uh, they um, operated in signs and wonders. And um, they um, made... Um, um, uh, Matthew lost the questions. Um, they um, they made me proud, and uh, they did uh, great works and uh, did uh, good things uh, for the kingdom, and uh, they really um. Uh, impressed me but the, the most impressive thing is to uh, lift Jesus name up and uh, they certainly lifted the name of Jesus up and everything they did uh, was an advertisement for the fact that uh, there there is another person there is another force and there is someone out there that uh, transforms lives and can transform your life and uh, there is a real power that knows all about you and can tell you your faults and can tell you your problems and can give you solutions uh, in this modern world and today uh, prophetic people can do the same thing uh, people who are called into the prophetic can live uh, holy lives and live lives set apart uh, for God totally devoted to God and they can walk up to you and tell you your problems and tell you your struggles and tell you a solution from God on how to get through your problems. Uh, so prophetic people can operate the same today and uh, they do today and uh, Matthew is a good example of that and um, they can uh, powerfully affect people's 
people's lives and effectively minister to people and change lives and have an influence on your community. Uh, you can have an influence on your community and uh, so my daughters did and uh, they made me very proud. I hope um, that was uh, sufficient uh, for that question. Question 4, in John 6, 7, Jesus is recorded asking you how would you feed the 5,000 uh, where were you the manager of the food and supplies as some think and did you understand what Jesus was tr asking you at that time Jesus was a rabbi um, people like to read things into stuff that uh, might not necessarily be there one of the ways that a rabbi teaches is the rabbi asks questions and uh, he asks questions of his students to uh, dig things out of the students to show students their gaps in knowledge and uh, the reason Jesus asked me uh, where can we get the money uh, well what, it, what Matthew forgets what it says there but uh, where can we buy enough for these uh, people um, the reason Jesus asked me is he had me thinking. He had me thinking that it's impossible to feed all these people. And uh, we were put in a situation where things were impossible. Some of the disciples said, oh, this guy's got uh, a couple of fish and five loaves, but that's not enough for everybody. So they started thinking, we started thinking, well, we can try and feed uh, the people, but pretty well only feed ourselves with this. Um, so, um, um, just a phone call. Um, um, they, they, they started thinking, but they're thinking in the flesh, and uh, they, um, they um, couldn't work it out, but they were trying to work it out. Uh, they are trying to say uh, that, um, that here's uh, some of the solution. Uh, so Jesus really had it stumped, and this was the first time that with, with uh, Jesus uh, multiplied uh, food, and we we didn't know that it was possible. And when you don't know something is possible, um, it becomes a barrier. Um, it becomes something that really is uh, impossible for you if you don't have faith. And um, uh, Matthew's reminded of the guy Roger Bannister who, who um, ran the four minute mile and he was the first person to break the four minute barrier in the mile run, the first person in history that it's been recorded, that times have been recorded and he broke the four minute mile which was said to be impossible to do and uh, since then um, over 400 people have uh, have or more than 400 people have uh, broke the four minute mile and ran the four minute mile um, because someone proved that it was possible. So uh, we'd never seen uh, duplication um, happen before. We have, had, hadn't seen multiplication happen before. It's a sign and a wonder and it's a miracle. Uh, Heidi Baker in Mozambique has seen this happen many times and other saints uh, operating in the glory of God have seen multiplication happen but uh, we hadn't seen it before. It was new to us. So there's no great uh, reason why Jesus asked me simply because he wanted uh, me to think about it and uh, me to be stumped and uh, then learn something from uh, being stumped. I certainly never forgot the miracle and uh, and uh, we we saw uh, disciples um, in the future multiply food uh, the same way as uh, Jesus uh, did it. So um, a lot of uh, a lot of uh, people assume that we were just regular men and uh, three years of walking with Jesus and the baptism of the Holy Spirit didn't do anything to us but many of us uh, went on and did mighty exploits uh, for God and uh, including myself and uh, we saved uh, the multitudes of people and uh, led multitudes to people and healed people and did all sorts of signs and wonders that we'd seen Jesus did and we did even greater things and uh, it's um, 
it's disturbing sometimes to think that uh, people can live with the whole Bible. Uh, they can live with the same Holy Spirit and uh, and uh, worship the same Jesus and have access to Jesus and uh, have the ability, uh, well, have people in the world that can train you to uh, hear from Jesus and you've got access to the Holy Spirit and you've got the Bible and you've got all the teaching in the world. Sometimes we wonder why uh, people just don't capture uh, Jesus and get on with it and do miraculous things on the earth. Um, so it's a, it's a wonder to some of us. Um, sometimes um, it just comes down to uh, the fact that the same things happen to you is that you don't know things are possible. You don't know what is possible. Um, Matthew talking to a saint and uh, um, bringing my words to you uh, is something that many people would say that's impossible uh, but it is possible because he's doing it and uh, he's not making up the answers himself although we do use his intellect uh, to answer questions so if Matthew doesn't understand a question uh, that's being asked for instance uh, he doesn't understand it and so I can't answer it because he can't get the question to me because he doesn't understand it so we are limited uh, to things uh, Matthew understands and words he uses and so um, but um, I'm doing the impossible speaking through a person on earth and coming to earth and visiting uh, a saint on earth and speaking through him and it's often uh, when we know what's possible that uh, we see someone doing something and, and, and something possible being done it break opens uh, the grounds for us to uh, do the impossible ourselves so Jesus did it that day he asked me a question uh, which was uh, impossible to feed uh, all those people and he made um, us aware he made us all aware that it was impossible to feed all these people and um, I think uh, Matthew thinks uh, it, it was 200 denarii they said 200 days wages to feed um, all those people and um, so um, even if we had the money how would we carry all the food back so um, the, we were faced with something impossible and then Jesus came through and showed us that even the impossible can be beaten through faith and uh, that's the lesson that we learned that day it's a lesson I always understood and I hope uh, that you know that uh, you can do the same question five uh, Philip, you're at the wedding of Cana. Can you tell us about the first recorded miracle of Jesus that day? Uh, once again, uh, once again, we're talking about something that was impossible. Uh, we've just covered the feeding of the 5,000. We've seen Jesus do the uh, miracle in Cana and uh, turn water into wine. And uh, so we should have been open uh, for the miraculous and we should have been open for the impossible to happen um, because we saw it on that day. Uh, Jesus used uh, water that was used for uh, cleansing and washing feet and washing hands and he used that water and uh, turned it into wine. Um, I haven't got a lot to say. Um, I, I, I can imagine that uh, if you went to a wedding and uh, the um, bar tab had run out at the wedding and uh, the, um, the uh, host of the wedding uh, announced to the people that, um, that uh, they'd reached their limit on the bar tab and there were no more drinks, um, you can imagine a, a man walking in and saying, um, you know, um, there, I'm just going to create some wine and you can drink this wine. I'm going to create a white and a red wine and they're going to be good quality and you can drink that. If you can imagine that happening today, that uh, a man uh, created two barrels of wine 
uh, enough to last everyone. And you can imagine drinking the wine, and it was an exquisite wine. Um, you can imagine the same miracle happening today. It's uh, it's hard to um, just talk about a, a miracle in the Bible, like the wedding of Cana's miracle, um, and and people just think, oh, you turn water into wine, and that was impossible, and it really was impossible. Like, how how do you how do you take water and turn it into uh, fermented grape grape juice? How how do you uh, make the quality of the wine which takes years to ferment and years to mature, how do you bring that maturity into the water uh, and and uh, the maturity into the wine that you make? You could turn uh, water into grape juice uh, possibly through a miracle, but how do you ferment that grape juice and uh, turn it into alcoholic wine and how does uh, how do you uh, give uh, wine a maturity that is uh, born out of years of, of sitting um, in a second? These are the sort of questions that were running through our mind because um, the people at the feast, uh, the master of the feast said that this was the best wine and why did um, why did you bring out the best wine at the last? Because normally um, they start with the best wine and as people get drunk, drunk that is, as people get inebriated uh, with the wine, they bring out um, the lesser quality wines because your palate can't taste it as well because you're fairly uh, inebriated or drunk. Um, so you can't taste the wine and it's true that uh, we do that today, we can do that today. And so, um, so how did that happen? Uh, it was an amazing feat. It was the first thing that Jesus did. He, uh, he also uh, uh, celebrated uh, the fact that um, he enjoys a, 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 a man and a wife getting together. He celebrated Adam and Eve, uh, a couple, uh, getting together as as the first creation. Uh, he he celebrated the marriage covenant. Um, the marriage covenant is something that uh, is very um, very important today. It's something that um, many people today feel that you don't have to be married. Uh, you don't have to just be gay uh, to uh, have a couple that want to be married um, and uh, have gay marriage um, between two men, but um, so many Christian couples uh, are living together. So many Christian uh, singles are having sex together um, before they're married. They get engaged and start having sex and um, this is not something that uh, God really approves of. Uh, he can forgive anything, and uh, he does forgive anything, but uh, certain couples bring a curse into their life uh, when they sleep together before marriage. So Jesus was affirming that uh, he was uh, for marriage, and uh, he was going to bless this marriage. And um, even if people were drinking to excess, on the day uh, at the wedding uh, and getting inebriated, Jesus created the wine uh, that uh, some of them could have got more inebriated from. Um, and he created the best wine, uh, the best wine that would seen. It wasn't a lower quality. And it just speaks of Jesus all around. He's an amazing person. Uh, he was amazing uh, to travel with. And this was, um, this was a miracle that... Uh, that wasn't forgotten easily by people. Most of the miracles of Jesus weren't forgotten easily. Um, there, there's a miracle in, in people actually even uh, coming to believe in Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit moving on their life and them accepting Jesus to be their Savior. That's a miracle and uh, we're always impressed with that and Jesus led many people to himself and so did we through the power of the Holy Ghost. And uh, so um, 
So it was a fabulous day and uh, as all uh, young apprentices, uh, we all wanted to know uh, how he did that. Um, uh, Matthew's met an evangelist that has uh, turned water into wine before and um, that miracle has happened in the modern day and, uh, and believe me, if you did that at a wedding these days and um, they, the bar tab ran out and uh, you came to the rescue and created barrels of wine uh, for them, um, you'd have a few converts too. Question, uh, question six. In Acts, you were sent to meet an important Ethiopian to explain baptism to, and to baptize. Can you tell us about what you taught him? Um, so, um, the, the scripture that uh, she's referring to, that Julie's referring to is, it, it goes, now an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip saying, arise, go, go toward the south along the road which goes from Jerusalem to Gaza, this is desert, right? So first of all, an angel spoke to me. Now, for an angel to speak to a person, you'd have to be able to see angels and you'd have to be able to believe that angels could speak and you'd have to see and believe that angels could speak and the third thing you'd need to do is obey that angel for that to happen. So many people today doubt that saints can visit, uh, they doubt that angels can speak, they doubt anything supernatural. Uh, they certainly believe in Ouija boards and clairvoyance and, and witchcraft. That's uh, quite easy for people to believe that there's something happening there. Many Christians will go to a seance or, or go to a palm reader and think it's harmless fun and, and find out the future. But uh, when you start talking about meeting angels, angels and meeting saints from heaven, people start to say, oh, you've got to test the spirits. So anyway, an angel spoke to me. And so, uh, verse 27, this is uh, Acts uh, 8, verse 27, So he arose, and behold, a man from Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority, under Candace, the queen of Euth Ethiopians, who had charge to all the treasury, and had come down from Jerusalem to worship. He was returning and sitting in his chariot. He was reading Isaiah the prophet. Then the spirit said to Philip, go near and overtake his chariot. So first of all an angel said to go there, so I went there. And then the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said go and overtake his chariot. So secondly, you'd have to hear from the Holy Spirit. And how many of you are living a Christian life and you can't hear the Holy Spirit speak? So uh, the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, go and catch up to his chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said to him, do you understand what you're reading? And, and he said, how can I unless someone guides me? Uh, which is true of the Bible. Uh, so many of you, so many people listening and so many people uh, reading the book, this will eventually be read the Bible and the Bible doesn't make sense to them and uh, you need supernatural help to understand the Bible and um, Philip was there who was uh, like I was there, uh, that must have been Matthew speaking, um, but I was there uh, and I had the Holy Spirit's help and guidance and I was able to share with the person um, just as the Holy Spirit is available to you uh, to explain the Bible to you. You honestly can't understand the Bible in your carnal mind. Uh, you need to have the Holy Spirit uh, explain the Bible and open the Bible up. So I opened it up and he asked Philip to come and sit with him. The place of the scripture that he read was Isaiah 53 verse 7 and 8 and it says he was led as a sheep to the slaughter and as a lamb before its shearer is silent so he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation his justice was taken away and who can declare his generation for his life was taken from the earth. Uh, so the eunuch answered Philip and said, I ask you, of whom does the prophet say this is, of himself or some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth, beginning at the scripture, and preached Jesus to him. 
And then they went down the road and they come to some water and the eunuch said, see here is the water, what hinders me from being baptized? So in your question, um, you asked um, uh, what happened there. Um, uh, you were sent to meet a very important Ethiopian to explain baptism and to baptize. Can you tell us more about what you taught him? Um, the, the Jews, um, uh, Matthew has heard that the Jews, uh, when they read uh, the Bible uh, in order and they read through the book of Isaiah, um, they actually skip Isaiah chapter 53. They just don't read it. Um, Isaiah 53 uh, is, a, is a scripture that prophesies the life and death of Jesus Christ on the cross. And, uh, and to, to many, this would be a strange thing. Like uh, this Ethiopian asked me, is he speaking of himself or is he speaking of another man and who is this? So this was a golden opportunity set up by an angel and the Holy Spirit for me to minister to this man and uh, show him that... Uh, the, the man that was crucified in, in Jerusalem um, a little while back was actually Jesus the Christ. And Jesus the Christ is the Messiah, uh, the, the anointed one, the one that was waited uh, and waited upon by the Jewish people. And this guy was a Jew. And so I explained, uh, just like Jesus through uh, the road to Emmaus, went through the scriptures and shared uh, all the prophecies of Jesus or a lot of the prophecies of Jesus um, to the men on the road of Emmaus. Um, I went through the scriptures and went to specific texts um, from... Um, I went to specific texts... Um, um, throughout the Bible that prophesied uh, ones in uh, in David, uh, David's books, the Psalms, and um, I went through specific books and uh, and and showed him um, that uh, or quoted um, scriptures that I knew um, to him uh, what was prophesied about Jesus and I explained the gospel to him I explained that Jesus was the one that we had to believe in and he was the true entrance point to God and um, and I explained the whole Christian faith and uh, I explained also I did explain uh, what a symbol of uh, um, of you, you being a Christian is to be baptised and that's why the eunuch said why can't I be baptised here it was the Holy Spirit leading on the eunuch uh, first of all to ask the question who is this speaking of is this speaking of another man and the Holy Spirit led the eunuch to say why can't I get baptised here and um, I baptised him um, I also then went on and uh, translocated to another place uh, it says um, um, uh, now when they came up out of the water the spirit of the Lord caught Philip away so he, the eunuch saw him no more and he went his way rejoicing but Philip was found in Astos and passing through he preached in all the cities until he came to Caesarea um, Astos is A-Z-O-T-U-S and he preached in all the cities until he came to Caesarea. C E C A E S A R E A for the typist. Yeah. So um, so there's another miracle uh, going physically in your body from one place to another through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now some people in witchcraft uh, can move uh, one body to another um, and uh, and uh, they can move with their spirits from one place to another and appear in certain places in their spirit. Um, this is called astral traveling and uh, it's witchcraft and, and, um, and it's not uh, really uh, 
sanctioned by God um, but it is possible for a human to do that well it certainly is possible for uh, a man to go from one place or a man or a woman to go from one place to another the whole physical body and uh, this uh, this is possible and many men and women do this today and uh, it's going to become more and more prevalent as days go past um, Question, I'm going to skip a question here. Uh, question 7. Um, on July 27, 2011, Turkish news agency and Dolly, A-N-A-D-O-L-I, reported finding your tomb inside a newly excavated church in Harabish, H-E-H-I-R-A-P-O-L. ISH and where you were buried. They said the writings on the tomb and walls and the design of the tomb proved it was yours. Is it your tomb? Yes it was my tomb and uh, Matthew isn't just making that up. Um, that was a good question there Julie and uh, it was my tomb. So uh, I don't have to say much more about that um, but it's tremendous that in uh, in these days excavations and archaeology is uncovering cities and towns that were mentioned in the Bible and they're finding things. Uh, uh, the Wyatt expedition have, have found chariot wheels um, from, from the Egyptian army that chased uh, Moses through the Red Sea. Uh, they found that. Um, Wyatt uh, believes he's found the Ark of the Covenant um, and uh, there's um, there's many excavations that are proving biblical truths and uh, it's just a sign and a wonder that um, that uh, my tomb was found and uh, uh, people can rejoice. Uh, it, it's good that you've got this on video that more people would find that out. Um, question 9, why were you mentioned in the Gospel of John only and not the other Gospels? Um, Matthew heard this once and it bears repeating that um, the different gospel writers uh, wrote um, the things that appealed to them and stood out to them um, and so John uh, felt to include me in, in his writings. It wasn't because I was a lesser person. The, the Gospel of John is vastly different to the Synoptic Gospels and, uh, and John had a different viewpoint and a different message uh, to portray Jesus as and uh, so I was mentioned in there. There was no uh, sleight of hand by the other Gospel writers. There was no um, them not liking me, no reason uh, for them not to mention me but uh, uh, I was mentioned by John and uh, I was in the Gospels even if I wasn't mentioned in the Gospels even if you didn't know about me um, I certainly uh, had an impact and uh, lived my life and did great things um, there's a lot of people um, that uh, had a great influence uh, that followed Jesus and had a great influence in the early Christian church that aren't mentioned in the Bible um, there's so many people that were saved and uh, led to the Lord by us that went on and did great works and planted churches and did all sorts of things that aren't mentioned in the Bible and uh, everyone listening uh, here no matter how good you are you'll never be mentioned in the Bible and uh, uh, I must say that uh, even though these are just interviews uh, from saints uh, I have to say that this book um, that uh, these interviews and the book that it becomes should never replace the Bible. Uh, if you've got questions uh, about what has been said by any of the saints, uh, you should uh, test all things like Paul says and test prophecies and um, and put aside the things that uh, you don't feel are right. Um, he, he says not to throw out all prophecies but test all things and, and those things that you don't seem right put aside. So. Um, so uh, this, uh, these uh, recordings are good uh, and profitable and you can learn certain things but you certainly um, 
don't uh, put uh, these uh, revelations and these uh, recordings on par with the Bible. So, um, yeah, uh, in answer to your question, John mentioned me, but um, there were miracles mentioned in Matthew that aren't mentioned anywhere else, and uh, certain people mentioned in different books that weren't mentioned anywhere else. And uh, there's many questions um, that uh, people would have if they started... Um, going through the books and seeing what's mentioned in one book and not mentioned in others and why. Um, it's particularly because um, each uh, person who wrote the gospel had a reason and they had things that were important to them and uh, I was important to John. Um, question 10. Some believed you were stoned and some believed you hung upside down by Emperor D D Demitin, D-A-M-I-T-I-A-N. What say you? I was hung upside down by the emperor. Um, I don't have to um, go into much detail. That's the answer to the question. And uh, and uh, um, I um, I rejoiced in my death, and I had uh, a holy uh, holy joy. You know, uh, Rodney Howard Brown and uh, Toronto blessing, uh, people break out in holy laughter and joy and uh, I had like a fit of that as I was dying that um, that uh, I was overcome with joy of seeing my Saviour and Lord. Um, I have to tell you that um, you've got to know Jesus, you know, you, you shouldn't just talk about him and hear about him and listen to sermons about Jesus, you need to meet him. You need to invite him down and meet him face to face and sit face to face with Jesus and have an interaction. You need to walk with Jesus day by day and see him in visions. You need to talk to Jesus back and forth and have two-way conversations with Jesus. Jesus really is the answer. None of us None of our recordings are, are important. Uh, what's important is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Jesus is my Lord, will always be my Lord, and is the King of Kings. He's amazing. So many people in the Christian faith know about Jesus, but they don't know Jesus. When you know Jesus, your life is transformed. When you know Jesus, you can walk in power. When you know Jesus, you know all about him, and you're moved by him, and you have his heart, and you have his spirit, and you can move according to uh, how he moves you. And uh, I want to encourage us all to get to know Jesus. Uh, Get to know who he is. Um, stop uh, playing religion. Stop uh, going to church and uh, hearing about Jesus and get to know him. Get, uh, get involved in supernatural schools and get to know, get your ears open so you can hear from Jesus and hear from the Holy Spirit and hear from the Father and get to know them on an intimate basis, the way that you'd know a wife or the way that you'd know a partner or the way you'd know a good friend. So many people just spend a couple of hours a week with Jesus in his presence in a church and then leave the whole rest of the week not really doing anything. And is that how you treat your best friend? Is Jesus really your best friend? Is he your sustenance? Is he the reason you're living? And if he is the reason you're living, ask him to speak to you and, and ask him questions and let him start to answer. And don't worry if you think it's your own mind making up the answers. It's not. Just start asking Jesus questions and let him speak to you. Lord Jesus and Father God, I pray that you will speak to the people listening to this video and reading this book. I, I, I pray that you uncap their ears and that you talk to them and encourage them to ask questions and start to ask answer questions and speak to them using their first name, their their first name at the beginning of what you say. So, so uh, say, Matthew, the answer to your question is such and such. Matthew, I love you. Matthew, I'm proud of you. Uh, let them hear their name spoken as the first sentence that they wouldn't be saying to themselves. And uh, I encourage you all to press into Jesus because Jesus is the source and he's the solution. 
uh, bonus question. Uh, uh, um, people have uh, described you as shy, naive, sober-minded, practical, um, always considering the bottom line. They're words and phrases that some people use to describe you. Does it explain your personality? Um, uh, practical describes how I was. Sober-minded uh, explains how I was. Um, if you've got childlike faith, you really are naive. Uh, you know, people, people who lose the, their naivety uh, are really people who've lost their childlike faith. Uh, when you believe that anything is possible, anything really is possible. When you start getting drowned with religion and false belief and unbelief, uh, that's when you start losing your naivety. So, yes, I continued to be naive. I was sober-minded and I was practical. Um, these are some of the words that do describe me. So some people, uh, wherever, uh, well, I know where you read this, uh, Julie, but where, wherever that was read, uh, Matthew thinks, um, yeah, they, they were good descriptions of me. I'm, uh, I was quiet when I needed to be quiet. Uh, when it was time to listen, I listened. I wasn't the first person to ask questions, but I certainly considered the questions being asked, and if the right question hadn't been asked, I'd ask the question. So I wasn't the leader of the group, but I certainly wasn't the last in the group. I was a deep thinker, and I still am a deep thinker. I was a bit of a cynic, and I questioned things. And uh, so uh, if Peter, Peter was normally the one who asked the questions, first of all, and Peter was certainly the one that tried to answer the questions, first of all, um, Jesus had to actually speak to Peter and say that um, he had to allow other people to try and answer the questions before he... Uh, he tried to answer it, so uh, he was actually told uh, to hold back and let other people have a go. And like I said, rabbis ask a lot of questions, and that's how he, they make you learn and uh, and assess whether you're picking things up that uh, have been said. So Jesus would uh, speak his parables, but he wouldn't come back all the time and like in scripture and explain what the parables are. So we we would ask him what the parables mean but often he'd ask us what do the parables mean and uh, we'd uh, give our opinions and then he'd give the true answer but a lot of the times we came up with what the parables meant um, we did uh, have um, an influence of the Holy Spirit before um, the um, before the upper room experience and uh, and uh, the Holy Spirit was traveling with us. Uh, if the Holy Spirit wasn't with us uh, before the upper room experience, uh, Peter wouldn't have known Jesus was the Messiah and wouldn't have spoken uh, the words of the Father that Jesus said. So, so we did have um, a, a part of the Holy Spirit um, before the upper room experience. Um, and... Uh, and so Jesus was always asking questions, and uh, and he was exciting uh, to to answer. So I wasn't the first to answer questions, but um, if I was asked by Jesus a question, I'd certainly speak up. And um, I wasn't afraid of answering questions, and I wasn't afraid of asking questions. If Peter hadn't asked um, a question and I wanted to know, I'd certainly ask the question of Jesus. i certainly ask questions of other people um, during my life. Um, and uh, I'm st still asking questions today, uh, still learning things today. Uh, you can study Jesus for a thousand years and still be uh, plumbing the depths of who Jesus Christ is. So if you're not speaking to Jesus yet, let me reiterate, you need to speak to Jesus and start asking him questions. Like any friend, uh, you get to know your friend when you ask questions. Um, so... Um, Question uh, 11, uh, well it's 12, but I missed the question, is uh, you were there, uh, please tell us about the upper room experience. Um, it would be like being uh, 
it'd be like uh, explaining building an aeroplane without an engine. An aeroplane is probably capable of flying, capable of going up in the air if something picked it and towed it, uh, towed it behind themselves, uh, behind another aeroplane. It would probably fly like a glider. But um, living a life as a Christian without the power of the Holy Ghost, without the power of the Holy Spirit, is like being a model aeroplane but without an engine. The Holy Spirit really is the engine room and when the Holy Spirit descended in the upper room and we all spoke, spoke in tongues, tongues wasn't the only thing that happened that day. We, we uh, had interpretation of tongues uh, that people heard us and heard us in their own language. So that's something that is possible today. It's, uh, uh, Matthew's read it in an account where someone spoke in tongues and the people uh, that were listening could hear it in their own language. So it is possible today for that to happen. So that happened, but all the other gifts started to manifest in our lives. Um, uh, I want to tell you that um, being a Pentecostal isn't all about tongues. If you can prophesy to people, you can change people's lives. If if you have a faith for healing and faith uh, to move in healing, healing people can change people's lives. Tongues is a personal thing and edifies yourself, but nearly all the other gifts edify other people and do things for other people. So um, I want you to know that there's more to the Holy Spirit than speaking in tongues. Uh, um, there's so many people in the world speaking in tongues, but if they just reached out and used the same Holy Spirit to prophesy, they could make such a difference in people's lives. Uh, really, honestly, being able to hear from Jesus and then sharing Jesus' words with a stranger, sharing Jesus' words with someone that's hurting, lifting someone up through uh, the gift of prophecy is amazing. And everyone can prophesy who's got the Holy Spirit. So when I was saying before that we had the Holy Spirit before the upper room experience, Baptists and uh, and traditional church uh, people, when they accept Jesus into their life, they the Holy Spirit comes into their life. But the Holy Spirit comes with power through the laying on of hands and baptism the Holy Spirit. So we had the Holy Spirit like a Baptist had when we were with Jesus. And then the power of the Holy Spirit came upon us uh, when we were baptized in the Holy Spirit. People still need to be baptized in the Holy Spirit today uh, to have that power and uh, to have that dynamis power and amazing power. So um, I hope that you've enjoyed my interview. I hope that uh, you learned a few things. Uh, uh, I hope that you understand uh, that we have to use Matthew's intellect and if he doesn't understand a question, he can't properly portray that question to us. And so uh, he's got to actually understand uh, most of the things we say. Uh, so he might necessarily understand uh, as he's saying what what we're saying, but uh, his intellect's got to grab it uh, as it's coming through him for him to properly describe what we're saying. So um, there's much wisdom in what we have to say and many things that we say are new to Matthew. Uh, certainly he couldn't uh, even begin to answer the questions if he was relying on his own intellect. But um, that being said, we do use his intellect and we do use his mind. He's not just a dumb figure sitting here uh, repeating my words. He's actually uh, having thoughts and having fears and having, I wonder how people are going to take that uh, question marks as, as we say things and uh, he uh, does everything by faith and does things because he's obedient. You know, he gets major attacks over this uh, before he does it and uh, he feels unworthy and uh, we come down and uh, we start to speak and uh, that starts to evaporate the more we speak. So um, uh, thank him for uh, doing what he does because it takes tremendous faith and uh, tremendous obedience to do what he does. God bless.